on today's show. Perhaps the most pernicious part of this whole thing is that in order to make their profit, what do they need? They need more prisoners. It's in their interest, right, to have more people behind bars because more people will be using their services and the system will be bigger and there'll be more, more money. Calls. Yeah, more phone calls, more money will be funneled into it. Prison Telecom is such a, an interesting example because you think to yourself like, oh, well, what's wrong with telecom service? Well, why do you think there needs to be a company that exists that only provides telecom service in prison? Because it looks nothing like what we get on the outside. It's exploitative. It's extractive. It's predatory. In what sense can you... Uh... The prison telecom industry is a $1.4 billion industry on its own. Prison telecom is a $1.4 billion? Correct. Wow. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Box, the social justice podcast that goes beyond the headlines and typical stories. We like to ask challenging and incisive questions that help us get to a deeper, more nuanced understanding of important issues. I'm your host, Doug Lassen, founder and executive director of the Urban Justice Center. I am delighted to have Bianca Tylak as our guest today. Bianca is executive director of Worth Rises, where she advocates against exploitations in prisons and jails. I first met Bianca about seven years ago when she asked me if she could start her project at the Urban Justice Center. I recall being thrilled. It was clear Bianca was sharp, dynamic, passionate, and had just the right experience with the finance and correction systems. She had worked at Citigroup and graduated from the Harvard Law School. The exploitation issues with prisons offered gross injustice and needed attention. I immediately and enthusiastically said yes, and I'm glad I did. Worth Rises is now an independent agency with a budget of around $4 million. Welcome, Bianca. Thank you. You know, I like to start asking people why they do the work they do. The world is full of fascinating and productive work options for those of us with privilege to make those choices. Tell us how you came to this exploitation of prisoner issues. Absolutely. So for me, this has been a winding road over probably 20, 25 years as to like how I got here, right? Started sort of as a youth being adjudicated, seeing some folks in my life and people that I love around the system. That's starting sort of some questions about what is our criminal legal system and what is our justice look like in this country and for who. Over the next decade, two decades, started to develop different skill sets, different sort of experiences in both education and professionally that started to point me in a particular direction, my passion in particular for this issue in a specific direction. And, you know, I think my time on Wall Street really honed this sort of question I had around who's benefiting from this really horrid system. The system that we know is decimating communities, families, harming children, destroying lives. At the end of the day, these things typically don't happen unless there's someone on the other side getting some kind of windfall. And that was really the beginning of my journey into this space and into defining what is worth rising. And that pisses you off, right? Oh, yes. <laughs> I, I think for any of these, the most effective advocates are the ones that are driven by passion. The angriest. Yeah, well, you need, you need, it's a productive use of anger and you need that passion to keep going and use, get all your creative juices out and be good at it. And why don't we set up for the listeners a little bit on the privatization aspect of it? We've had conversations where when I say privatizations of prisons and you go, no, privatizations of services and prisons, but I believe the services are your larger interests. If you can sort of set up the system and then we can talk about it. Sure. So the way we really think about this work is we are concerned with anyone and everyone who is collecting a financial windfall or otherwise generating revenue or wealth off of incarceration. And certainly one that obviously I think irks the nerves of a lot of people and ours and specifically is obviously the private sector. I do want to just as a side note note, they're not the only ones. Our government also collects some interesting windfalls from the system and exploits, for example, prison labor to a huge degree. More than 80% of prison labor today is just facility and maintenance. If you add correction industries, actual government-run businesses, that's like another 17%. So like 97% of prison labor is actually for the government. And so what does that mean in terms of like the ways in which our state budgets are like subsidized? 
But turning our attention to sort of privatization or some of the other things that are happening, which again, don't happen alone, they happen largely in these public-private partnerships. Typically, when people think of privatization, as you noted, they think of private prisons. And that's like, stop somebody on the street corner, right? That's the thing that their mind's going to go to if you say exploitation in prisons. They're like, oh yeah, private prisons. Now, private prisons are a problem and historically have been a big contributor to, I think, the laws that led us to mass incarceration and to these excessive carceral rates. But they actually make up a pretty small percentage of the carceral industry, right? And so about 8% of people who are incarcerated are actually held in private facilities. So when you think about it, that's not a huge, huge percentage. But the way we really think about, I think, more often on our team, just because there is so much attention already on private prisons, are these other services. So where is telecom service coming from? Where is food services coming from? Where is healthcare services coming from? And so many of these things have been privatized at this point. In fact, 100% of prison telecom is privatized. Construction as well. Right. But I would say like Prison Telecom is such a, an interesting example because you think to yourself like, oh, well, what's wrong with telecom service, right? And then I ask you to consider, well, why do you think there needs to be a company that exists that only provides telecom service in prison? Because it looks nothing like what we get on the outside. It's exploitative, it's extractive, it's predatory. In what sense can you... Uh... The prison telecom industry is a $1.4 billion industry on its own. Prison telecom is a $1.4 billion? Correct. Wow. Every single company in that space, for the most part, exclusively works in prisons and jails. So this is their market. 90% is controlled by just three companies, 80% by just two. And all three of those biggest firms are owned by private equity. So there is like a deep lens of like who's involved. Now, how are they predatory? They're predatory because in 2024, they are still charging incarcerated people and their families per minute for a phone call. When I don't think the rest of us have seen something like that in decades, right? Like if somebody told us we had to pay toll rates for calls, we'd be like, what? Now, you know, there's- So how much does it cost for somebody to call home and uh, call their loved ones? Within the last two, three years, it was as much as like $25 for a 15 minute phone call. It went down to maybe about $15 for a 15 minute phone call. And then today, because of a lot of the advocacy that's been done, it's come down a bit more, but we're still talking about places where it might be as much just 40 cents, 50 cents a minute. Look at memes on TikTok, right? With all these youth and all these different ones where they're like, I'm this old, right? And they like show you some kind of um, reference to age. And it's like, we're of the age where we paid for a text message, right? (laughs) Of like for a phone call where we remember those moments where we remember having to wait till 9 p.m. to have like free minutes. But that doesn't exist anymore. And a huge part of our population doesn't even recognize that as having ever existed. Now this message. We're here with Michael Barish of Barish & McGarry, lawyers for the 9-11 community. So 21 years after 9-11, incredibly, most of the half million people who were exposed to the deadly toxins still don't know they're entitled to free lifetime health care and compensation. Why do you think they haven't enrolled? Two reasons. First, many non-responders tell me that they didn't realize that, no matter their family history, nearly every cancer has been linked to the exposure to the World Trade Center toxins. Second, many of them feel guilty, and they don't want to take from others who have died. Thankfully, you won't be taking money from anyone since the Victim Fund and the health program have been fully funded by Congress. Susan, millions of dollars remain unclaimed. It's so important that you register. 68 cancers have been linked to the toxins. Remember, 9-11 didn't end on 9-11. Contact Barish and McGarry today at 911awards.com. That's 911awards with an S dot com. That brings me to a part of this that people also don't necessarily think about. Here are businesses making a lot of money, telecom, food, health, construction. They have lobbyists who want to create more prisons, but isn't it also they have lobbyists that want to create fear of crime so that we have more prisons? Is that... uh... Yeah, so their lobbying is like... It has layers. Whenever there's a big profit to be made, there are big lobbyists to be had. Exactly. So for something like prison telecom, you might have lobbyists that are opposing regulation. So we just passed a big bill in Congress that would increase the Federal Communications Commission or the FCC's regulatory authority of calls. 
who opposes that? The industry. Then you do have, for example, companies that are engaged in this industry, in the prison industry, that are advocating for harsher prison sentences. And if you take your private prisons as an example, and I use them as an example in this case because they are publicly traded. The two largest private prisons in our country are publicly traded, which means that they file an annual report, something called a 10K. And in that 10K, as required by SEC law, they have to include the risks to their business. And to your point, one of the risks to their business is a reduction in crime. Right. Including a reduction in the fear of crime. And it's an ugly cycle there. Well, fear mongering definitely serves their interest interest in like putting more people behind bars, right? Because if you fear monger society, and we know that that's been happening a lot recently, where even though crime rates are quite low, everyone's freaking out and thinking crime is going up. And this is being fed by the media and fed by this industry in large part, because for them, when people are afraid of crime, they're more likely to support candidates for office that are more likely to pass harsher sentencing laws. Politicians who take that position will get more money. It doesn't seem that hard to make people afraid of crime. No, it's a subject that people feel a lot of things about very quickly, right? And you mentioned earlier construction firms. Construction firms, for example, will actually donate to the campaigns of like tough on crime sheriffs or any sheriff who will essentially allow them to like build a new jail. Things of that sort are very common. Perhaps the most pernicious part of this whole thing is that in order to make their profit, what do they need? They need more prisoners. And so we ruin more people's lives, in a sense, connected just because these corporations want to make more money. I don't think they are totally to blame for it, but we have mass incarceration and there are, and having a corporate sector that will make more profits with more prisoners is part of that problem. Absolutely. It's in their interest, right, to have more people behind bars because more people will be using their services and the system will be bigger and there'll be more, more money. Calls. Yeah, more phone calls, more money will be funneled into it. I want to make a mention of like the use of the term prisoners. I think even those type of things are actually support, like something that the system has interest in, right? Language. And I think to the extent that we refer to people who are incarcerated as prisoners or offenders or inmates or these kind of terms, I think the field at this point looks at these as pretty pejorative terms because they're a label that allows us to put them into some kind of bucket that suggests they're different from the rest of us. And when we like instead refer to people who are inside as like mothers, Mothers and fathers and people that we know. They're people. Right? They're people. And they're people that we can identify with, that we can see, right? And the interesting part is like it can be as subtle as those type of terms, but it can also, it expands to actual terms that the industry has put to use. So to give you a quick example, take the concept or the term video visits. Video visits is a term that was initiated by the prison telecom industry. Why? Because when they first introduced video calls or video conferencing, which we are all very familiar with at this point in society, into prisons, they wanted to force people to use these video conferencing systems, right? So how were they going to do that? Well, they actually required the jails that they contracted with to eliminate in-person visits to force them to use this. And by using the term video visit, oh my. something that you and I would oh never, goodness. never acknowledge as a visit, they tried to synonymize them through language. Have they been successful at Incredibly it? successful. Oh, no. So many jails during this time actually did away with their visit rooms and put in place of their visit rooms video kiosks so that people who are inside those jails could no longer hug their loved ones. So this like language matters in this like really nefarious way. And I always say like not every slogan is trademark. It's not only the language, to me the biggest part of that language, and thank you for that, is dehumanizing the other. And it's so easy to consider people who are incarcerated as the other instead of as our brothers or sisters or parents or children. And uh, the more we can realize they are, they are our friends whose lives we're ruining. Not always totally ruined, but uh, really making challenging their lives in, in, in a serious way that often ruins them. And in many ways counterproductive to our own safety. Our carceral system has gotten so far away from serving our public safety, that it is predominantly a system that is meant to destroy lives.
Let me ask you a question. It's a natural question when you hear about privatization of prison services and prisons. Many of us, to some extent me included, think that the profit motive is often very powerful in making operations more efficient and effective. And is it possible that perhaps we could use some of that in the prison system? We all want to spend our money well. And is it possible that if we get some of those people with who know how to make profits and run things efficiently and effectively, the prisons could use some of that, might be better run? You know, I think that there's a lot of mixed feelings on whether or not the private sector like actually delivers all that. And I would say most specifically when it comes to partnerships with the government. I think few people would actually say that when it comes to partnerships with the government, the private sector is doing things cheaply. I think the reality is that they get away with a lot. The entire military industrial complex, right? Think about the amount that private sector can charge the government for particular things. And I would argue the same thing is true in prisons. Things are actually very expensive coming from the private sector. So much so that there's a really good case study. There have been a number of prisons or jails that have gone from being publicly operated to being privately operated and back to being publicly operated. And when they were publicly operated, it was cheaper to operate them. The counties actually saved money going back to public operation of the facility, even with the pensions, even with higher salaries, even with all of that. And they were better. Less people died, literally. I think the reality in this space is that you're talking about a space that is completely shuttered from society. There is no market forces at play here. Which prison should we get? But same thing goes for the person inside. Take prison telecom. The person inside doesn't get to decide. So the consumer who's actually using the service doesn't decide between Verizon and AT&T. No, the jail decides. And you know how the jail decides? Because most of these contracts have a commission. Which means that for every phone call that's made, the company gets a percentage and the jail gets a percentage. And whatever company offers the jail the highest percentage, they go with that one. And those people who are making the decision for who gets the contract don't have to use the service. So almost never does this idea of privatization making things better or cheaper play out accurately or to that effect in the prison context. Thank you for that. We can talk about like prison healthcare is a whole nother one. I mean, people are literally dying because of what's happening in privatization. Because they cheapen the the service with health. There's only two ways to make money in a business, right? Either you increase your revenue or you cut your expenses. And when you're in a prison context, increased revenue generally means more utilization, which means either adoption, but generally you get to adoption pretty quickly because you are contracted by the facility. So the only other way is to increase the number of people, which we already talked about. But the other way you can pad your bottom line is by cutting expenses. Reduce your services. Exactly. And make them less and worse. Exactly. And so in the case of healthcare, that's remarkably catastrophic. And so what we've seen, there's a really great example out there right now of a company named Corizon. Corizon was actually the largest prison healthcare company in the country a number of years ago. Because it was cutting so many of its services, it had started to actually lose contracts with states. States started to say, no, too many people are literally dying. Then this past year in 2023, they decided to move their headquarters to Texas in order to do a corporate maneuver that's actually only really allowed in Texas, and even there, pretty questionable. And that's what's called the Texas two-step. What they did was they divided the company into two, and they gave one half of the company all of the assets, which in this case were all of the contracts, and the other company all of the liabilities, which in this case- (laughs) You can't do that. (laughs) Right. I mean, it's it's short of, if not exactly, bankruptcy fraud. Once they gave this company all of the liabilities, which included 475 medical malpractice lawsuits, many of them wrongful death suits for people who died in their care, in custody, after sometimes just days in jail from completely treatable things- pre-existing conditions that they knew they were coming in with that they did not care for, those literally constituted roughly over a billion dollars in medical malpractice suits and they filed for bankruptcy. Have they gotten away with it? It is in the middle of the courts right now. And thankfully, a group has been appointed of impacted people and they have just filed to have the entire bankruptcy dismissed. 
But right now, it's still moving through the courts, and they want to settle that billion dollars of medical malpractice lawsuits for less than $50 million. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about corporations moving to the space. And by the way, that company that had all the assets and all the contracts rebranded and continues to provide services as the third largest prison healthcare company in this country. With no liability for- With no uh, liability. That can't be. I I can show it to you. I have no doubt that creative lawyers will think of schemes like this, but hopefully our courts won't allow it. Hopefully. And, you know, I think what's really, you know, I want to give a lot of credit to folks like Senator Warren who are paying attention and and actually speaking up and challenging these things from their positions as electeds and others. But, you know, it is this type of thing that is rampant in the prison context where I, exploitation, exploitation, where corporations and financial like unscrupulous people with financial interests basically try to get away with what they can get away with because their feeling is no one cares and no one's watching. To use the wrong language because they're prisoners. Right. And they're not our brothers and sisters and parents. Hi, everyone. We're trying to get the word out about the podcast. So if you like it, please make sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app. And please rate us five stars on the Apple podcast. And finally, please pass this episode on to your friends. Thank you for your support. Now this message. We're here with Michael Barish of Barish and McGarry, lawyers for the 9-11 community. So 21 years after 9-11, incredibly, most of the half million people who were exposed to the deadly toxins still don't know they're entitled to free lifetime health care and compensation. Yes, it's frustrating that most non-responders still haven't taken advantage of the two programs that were created for them. Downtown office workers, residents, students and teachers were breathing the same toxic dust. Not surprisingly, they're getting the same cancers and they're dying of the same illnesses. More people have now died of 9-11 illnesses than the nearly 3,000 people who died on that day. Sadly, that's true. So I urge everyone to protect yourselves. Register for the health program and the victim fund now, even if you're currently healthy. Protect yourselves. Protect your families. Contact Barish and McGarry today at 911awards.com. That's 911awards with an S dot com. Solution. If you could design the system you wanted, what would it look like? Our solution is, you know, our mission. Our mission is to dismantle the industry. Assuming we have a penal system in this country, is the solution pretty simple? No privatization. I think that's the beginning, right? Like that's the beginning of a transformation because it's hard to transform a system that we have people fighting for, right? And so I think, or people collecting wealth from. And so I think we start by dismantling the industry and ensuring that no one has a financial interest in protecting this system. Well, no one has a financial interest in increasing prisoners. Well, that too, right? But like protecting the system the and, particular system. and maybe expanding the system that no one has that interest. Or an interest in not allowing the system to shrink. Right. Well, that's exactly what I mean by protecting the system and not expanding the system is like allowing for transformational change to happen. So I think of us in large part as an organization that focuses on removing the roadblock to transformational change. So if others and our our colleagues in the movement are working on things like sentencing reform or drug legalization or, you know, things of that sort, then how do we remove the barriers, the people and the corporations that are their opponents, that are lobbying against their bills? And I guess one of the problems here is the one you talked about with the language, that once you're talking about criminals and prisoners, the general public loses their interest in the system and it gets harder. So can we get there? Oh, absolutely. I always say this. I say this to my team from every small thing to every big thing. I don't fight battles that I don't plan on winning. So <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Tell me, Bianca, what changes have you been able to see? Absolutely. So, you know, we were talking about prison telecom, and I think that's where we've spent so much of our energy over the last few years. And we were able to pass one of the first bills in the country with our partners in New York City to make 
phone calls free in a jail system. And that was, as I said, in New York City back in 2018. And since then, we've been able to replicate that in cities and counties around the country, then in the federal system. And in 2021, we passed our first state bill in Connecticut. In 2022, we passed California. And in 2023, we passed Colorado, Minnesota, and Massachusetts. Those bills have saved families over $370 million over the, just the last few years and given over 300,000 incarcerated people and their families access to completely free communication. And just to draw that out, it's not only the money and it's not only the access, but it's actually people who are removed from society have a chance to have a few minutes. And uh... Yeah, it's not a few minutes. We've created over two billion additional call minutes. That's great. I don't mean to leave this question for last because it's actually the most important questions, but uh, can you talk a little bit to how this might have real impacts on people's lives, not just the telecom, but the whole privatization issue? Yeah. And again, I'll broaden it from just privatization to exploitation more generally. Fair enough. It's so deep. And I think in, in, you know, you said something earlier about language being dehumanizing. So is exploitation, right? When we yeah, exploit people, <laughs> right? It's like, by definition, the most dehumanizing thing we can do. Yeah. And it tears up people's soul. Right now, we're working on a campaign to end the exception in the 13th Amendment in Congress. And that exception is one that very few Americans know anything about. The 13th Amendment we celebrate for having abolished slavery, except right in the middle of it, there's a clause that says, accept as punishment for a crime. And it's the reason that slavery continues in our prisons and jails and that we so readily exploit and have normalized the exploitation of prison labor. And I think when we sat down, when I personally sat down and talked to currently and formerly incarcerated people about what it would mean to end this exception, you know, the reaction I got and the responses I got were, it would mean people would see me. It would mean that I was recognized as part of our society. It would reinforce and acknowledge my humanity. It would return my dignity, right? It was, it was something really powerful about just like what it does to the human being to be so cast out, to be so ignored to be kind of unworthy of protection of things that the rest of us would never tolerate, right? And so I think that's the beginning of it. And devoid of sympathy for the exploitation. You know, I should say it ripples far outside the walls of the facilities because when we are talking about going back to like phone calls, it's like, well, what is the impact on the child? What's the impact on the spouse? What's the impact on broader community? And I think you can't really separate all of these, right? Like that humanity in a person might be the difference between them, you know, sitting in their cell or them going to a program because they see something in a society that wants to see them win. It's like a child who gets to talk to their loved one, their parent, every day as opposed to one who never sees them or never talks to them because they can't afford to. The reality of one in three families going into debt over the cost of calls with a loved one and what does that mean for their financial stability and the well-being both like mental and physical that comes from that and what does it mean for society for us to have people who are disconnected coming home to not have a community to not have a support network and how do we think they're going to be successful. So I think the impact are like expansive and they reach every single one of us. And so this is not an other. This is us in society, in community, together needing to figure out what to do. Well, I hope you're successful with helping us to see incarcerated people as people, as human beings who we care about and and we should care about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Bianca, thank you so much for coming by. Just want to say, Bianca, again, runs Worth Rises. Worth Rises has a website and they accept donations. And I hope you all, this is really just a beginning. I hope you all go and uh, look at uh, be, the, the website of Worth Rises and uh, and support Bianca. Visit call. us at worthrises.org. And you can also follow us on all the social media platforms at Worth Rises. And all the resources are well spent. Yes. Good for you. Thank you very much, Bianca. Thank you, Doug. 